So I think we can start. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first session of the new lecture series Normative Production and Decision Making Processes in the Roma Curia, organized by the research group I direct at this institute entitled Normative Knowledge in the Praxis of the Congregation of the Council. I'm very pleased to open this new activity uh, with the lecture of Dr. Alexander von Teufenbach, a refined scholar and companion of countless hours of work in the bunkers of the Vatican archives. Alexander von Teufenbach re received her Bachelor in Philosophy and Theology from the Pontifical University uh, Gregoriana, where she continued her studies, also obtaining a licenza in dogmatic the uh, theology and ecclesiastical history. In 2002, uh, she obtained her PhD in theology at the same university on the topic The Meaning of uh, Subsisted in Lumen Gentium 8 on uh, the self-understanding of the Catholic Church, directed by Carl Becker. She is now continuing um, or concluding a second PhD in ecclesiastical history on the topic of the ceremonial of the First Vatican Council, directed by uh, Professor Silvano Giordano. To this already rich and interdisciplinary academic education, she has also added other elements of professional training, such as the title as uh, archivist and paleographer achieved at the Pontifical School of Archivistic, Paleography and Diplomatics of the Vatican Archive. Dr. von Teufenbach's uh, research activities has been, uh, have been accompanied by teaching at the Regina Apostolorum University and the Pontifical Lateran University, and by various work experiences in historical archives aimed at rearranging archival fonts and making inventories. In particular, she is preparing an inventory of the Council of Trent archival fund at the uh, Vatican Archive. In the second half of this year, she will start a collaboration with the National Institute of Japanese Literature. Dr. von Teufenbach has participated and is participating in various research projects, focusing in particular on the 20th century among which it is worth mentioning the edition of the Diaries of the Sebastian Trump and the inconcluded material concerning the Theological Commission of the Second Vatican Council. The research in the Vatican uh, Archive on the Congregation of, uh, for Worship on the documentation concerning the preparation of the Constitution of the Liturgy uh, of the Second Vatican Council and another project, the research and preparation of indexes of the material of the Concilium ad Exequendum in the archives of the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments, or the research on Jewish and the Second Vatican Council in Israel. In addition to this, I would like to mention also the most recent project uh, on behalf of the Kodokawa Cultural Foundation on the relations between Japan and the Holy See in the 20th century. Interdisciplinarity, or better still, working in the interstitial spaces between different disciplines and research methodologies, undoubtedly characterized Dr. von Teufenbach's biography as a scholar and her scientific production. In her studies, in fact, she uh, skillfully harmonized elements from different disciplines, but complementary at, and in any case, all necessary to understand the complex dynamics of the history of the Apostolic See. She also makes use of tools for interpreting the sources, including um, archival uh, science and papal diplomatics, which are often somehow neglected in the theological research. Dr. von Teufenbach has, pus has published several books and numerous articles. I will, of course, not uh, mention all of them, but in view of the topic we are going to discuss today, I would like to highlight her works on Pius XII, in which she emphasized the pontiff's role as forerunner of the Second Vatican Council, and her numerous works on various aspects of the Second Vatican Council and the many actors involved, from John the Twenty uh, Third, the Pope who convened the Council, to Heribert Schauf, a German theologian of the Second uh, Vatican Council too, especially Sebastian Tromm, a Jesuit theologian who assisted Pius XII uh, in the uh, drafting of theological encyclicals and uh, uh, John XXIII in the preparation of the Second Vatican Council. Um, 
Sebastian Trump is also an important figure for my research group on the Congregation of the Council because he was one of the first modern scholars who approached the study of this dicastery. So we're, we have something, a lot in common, actually. The three volumes devoted to the diaries of Trump and uh, his participation in theological and, and faith and moral commissions of the Vatican, uh, Second Vatican Council were published by Alexandra van Teufelbach between 2006 and 2015, and she is now preparing the fourth volume. Today, Alexandra van Teufelbach will speak about a very important topic for the opening of this seminar series, how decisions are made in an ecumenical council the rules of the Council of Trent as a turning point in the development of council proceedings between tradition and innovation. Don't be surprised that a contemporary specialist is speaking to us today about events in the 16th century. To study and understand the decision-making processes practiced in the most uh, recent ecumenical councils, Dr. von Teufenbach had to turn back to the past in particular to the Council of Trent, the longest lasting ecumenical council in church history, but also to earlier councils. Today, we will discover with her the complex evolution of the Tridentine decision-making procedures and how they also influence the contemporary ecumenical councils. So I therefore uh, leave the floor to you uh, and uh, I thank you again for being with us today. Thank you, Benedetta. Good afternoon, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor for me to be able to speak here about the rules of the Council of Trent in front of an expert audience. The regulations of the Council of Trent are not only the first complete regulations of an ecumenical council, but they are also in terms of contents, the keystone of procedures applied in councils. Therefore, it is also a great pleasure to see today that I'm not the only one who is interested in this little studied, yet not secondary topic. However, today's topic is also a bit daring. In 1870, exactly on June the 5th, while the first Vatican Council was being celebrated in the Vatican Basilica, Pope Pius IX had summoned the prefect of his secret archives, Augustine Tyner. We do not know what they said to each other. However, later the press and then many historians, primarily Ignaz von Döllinger, publicly claimed that the Pope had sacked Tyner that day. The meeting would have served, so Döllinger writes, to have the keys to the archives handed over to him, and soon afterwards, the door leading from Tyner's apartment in the Tower of Winds to the archives would also be closed with a brick wall. The reason that Döllinger gives for the Pope's decision is simple. According to him, Augustine Tyner had been removed because he had handed over the regulations of the Council of Trent to the conciliar minority. That is, so uh, to those bishops, especially Germans, who did not want papal infallibility to be proclaimed. But what on earth was written in that regulation of the Council of Trent that induced Pope Pius IX to dismiss the prefect of his archives just on the suspicion that he had handed it over to some minority bishops. The first thing when investigating such a crime is not to look for the motivation, but to, to look for the body of the crime. So <laughs> I would first like to talk about the manuscripts of the regulation of the Council of Trent in order to illustrate them and then also to understand if and which manuscript was delivered into the hands of the anti-infallibilists. In the Vatican archives, there are seven copies of the manuscript of the regulation. They are all more or less written in the same period. <coughs> the first one is supposed to have been the one you can find today in file 103 of the Council of Trent Fund. 
It was written immediately after the first session of the council, so probably in 1548. The rules of the Council of Trent, this I must tell you immediately, is not a group of rules prepared before the council, but a narrative of procedures composed after the council. So rather than a group of rules, is a procedural narrative. However, let us return to the year 1548. Council Secretary Angelo Massarelli in that year first prepared the Council decrees for publication. It was necessary to work quickly because without permission the decrees of the first period had already been printed in Milan. Immediately there was haste and the authorized publication saw the light of day in the same year 1548. So the decrees were immediately made public. Quite different was the story of the publication of the acts of the council, the minutes and the, of the session, the opinions of the council fathers expressed in speeches and writings. These official minutes written by the secretary of the council are of fundamental importance to understand the course of the council, I mean, its procedures. The cardinal legates, aware of gravity of the historical moment and therefore of the importance of this council documentation, had hired a secretary already months earlier and this is the first time in the history of councils. But he never took up the post. It was only from April the 1st, 15 46 that Angelo Massarelli, who was already in Trent as secretary to Cardinal Legate Servini, who also took up the office of secretary to the council, and as Yedin writes, without ever receiving an official appointment. Massarelli and his collaborators immediately produced all the documents in more than one copy. Multiple copies of the same text can still be found in the Apostolic Archives today, and notaries attested their conformity even at that time. The Secretary of the Council himself prepared for publication the Acta Concili, initially in a short version, according to the wish of Cardinal Cervini, and then a complete one under Pope Pius IV. Nevertheless, nothing was published. Massarelli died soon after having finished the work and arranged, fortunately, in his will that the documentation of the council be preserved in the Castel Sant'Angelo archives. When the archive was moved to its present location, Massarelli's volumes were also moved to the Vatican archives. Beside the first version of the regulation written in 1548, a version was also produced for publication, which is found today in volume 115. Both versions, which apart from minor changes are identical, are relatively short. In fact, they only summarize the procedure followed in the first period of the council. Augustine Tyner, would certainly not have handed over or copied these files for the conciliar minority in 1870. Five other manuscripts remain to be evaluated. There's a file marked with the number one. In that file, the regulation is there twice. The second one is incomplete. The first one is more interesting because it is full of Tyner's annotations. It does not seem very likely to think that he could have given it to the outside world, since he considered it too much his own that he wrote his annotations on it. Then there's the official file, 116. It's a large volume, combines what Massarelli had prepared for publication. 
and the volume begins precisely with the Council's regulation as the Secretary had seen them applied during 18 years of the Council. It was complete, well readable, and above all, it was the official version. Was this a copy that Augustine Tyner had given to the anti-infallibilist bishops? On a close reading of the minutes um, of the directing commission of the First Vatican Council, we can rule it out. In fact, already three years before the accusation against Tyner, seven large volumes containing the official acts of the Council of Trent were taken to the apartment of Cardinal Bilio, who at the time was the head of the Congregation of the Holy Office. There, the consultors before the Council, consultors including historian and minority bishop Josef Hefele, were able to consult the volumes and also cite them in their work. Among these volumes was the number 116. They were not returned to the archives until 1873. There remains only a last chance to understand which manuscript Taina might have delivered into the hands of the anti-infallibilist bishops, file 136. It is actually much smaller than the other, today we might say pocket size, and contain twice the regulation. Yet even here is a problem. In Munich, in the Bayerische Staatsbibliothek, there has been for centuries a codex with the rules of Trent, known of course already at the time of Vatican I. It was copied, in all probability, from the second manuscript found in volume 136. Another copy, also compiled before Vatican Council I, is in the Trent City Library. Our search for a manuscript that Augustine Tyner could have stolen ends here. Not only did the minority have access to the regulation through Bishop Hefele, but the copy of that regulation was also in Munich, where Döllinger could easily consult it. I should add that in March 2019, I found the manuscript in the manuscript department of the Vatican Library, another manuscript of the regulation. It too follows Concilium Tridentinum 136. I found this copy thanks to the transcription made by Pio Martinucci, who was a master of ceremonies who prepared the liturgy for the First Vatican Council. Then, after the Council, the manuscript was forgotten and the scholars of the Gerres Gesellschaft, who published all the Acts of Trent from 1901 to 2001, could not find it. Whether Pope Pius IX really accused Augustine Tyner of delivering the regulation into the hands of the conciliar minority, we do not know. In any case, I would have, it would be have very unwise since this regulation was not secret and yet it was accessible to the bishops of the minority in various other places. It is possible, however, that it was not the manuscript that concerned Pius IX, but the content of this regulation. That I would now like to analyze by starting with the people attending the council. The Protestant canonist Hinchus is surely right that the number of participants at the Council of Trent did not correspond to the exceptional significance that the decisions of this synod came to have for the Catholic Church. At the beginning of the Council, there were 30 participants. After the third session, in December 1563, signed the conciliar decrees six cardinals, three patriarchs, 25 archbishops, 169 bishops, seven abbots, and seven superior general. Not going to a council or sending only a few representatives was typical of the council of the 15th century, 
especially the Council of Basel. Also, Paul III, in the Bull of Convocation for the Council of Trent, had called for those who by right or custom had to attend an ecumenical council. That right was not so clear. Yedin writes, written ecclesiastical law carried no clear provision as to who should be invited to the ecumenical council. However, canonists agree that all prelati majores, that is, bishops and other possessors of episcopal jurisdiction, should be summoned in a canonical form. On the basis of customary law, moreover, Cardinal Jacobazzi added that abbots and general of religious orders could also be invited to appear at the council and especially all those who had committed themselves by oath to attend the council in taking possession of their office. End of the quotation. The Pope immediately forbade the appointment of procurators of bishops. This is one of the great differences with the way previous councils had been proceeded. The reason for this prohibition is well explained by Yedin. The authority of the bishops, it's a new quotation, to bear with witness in the faith in the council and to determine ecclesiastical discipline is ultimately rooted in their episcopal consecration and is therefore linked to their person. They, in the exercise of this authority, cannot allow themselves to be represented by whomever they like best, as canon law allows in other juridical matters. End of this quotation. Pope Paul III granted the German bishops alone to send procurators. Regarding the granting of the deli deliberative vote, the text is unclear but the decision of the legates was not to grant it. In the course of the council, more and more titular bishops arrived in Trent, often also as procurators of absent residential bishops. In this case, they were granted by virtue of their episcopal consecration, the right to vote, but even they could only vote for themselves since the proxy did not grant an extra vote. Instead, proxies without episcopal consecration gradually lost importance until they be, were banned altogether in 1561. In the regulations, the secretary of the council explains how the procurators had to show their mandate to the legates and presidents and excused the proxies so that their absence would be recognized as legitimate. When the legates could not take care of these checks, their task was entrusted to a few chosen uh, council fathers who received and checked the warrants and excuses and presented everything to the general congregation for decision. Exactly this was also done at the First Vatican Council, when five bishops were elected as judges of absence. The emperor, kings and princes sent representatives of the council to the Council of Trent. The situation for the representatives of the prince was, of course, quite different from that of the procurators of the council fathers. In fact, the representatives of the rulers were under no obligation to go to the council, much less to testify in that assembly their faith. Massarelli dwells much on them, but the reason of time, for reason of time, I will not deal with them. I have already mentioned several times the legates and presidents of the council. Uh, ever since the first Ecumenical Council of Nicaea, the Pope, when he did not appear in person at a council, sent his own representatives in Trent. Paul um, III commissioned three cardinals on February 22, 1545, 
es ist legate, legates ad latere. And president of the council also giving them the necessary delegation to dissolve or move as needed the assembly. As Massarelli illustrated right at beginning of his account of the Tridentine regulations, there were three legates on the first phase of the council under Julius III. In the second phase, which took place in Bologna, there was instead one legate and two nuncios. All three of them were presidents of the council. Under Pius IV, so in the third phase, there were seven legates and presidents. The image is from the third, uh, from the third phase. In theory, the legates were always supposed to follow directives from Rome. Following Torquemada's theory, it was believed that the council without the Pope or without the legates could have no jurisdiction. The link with Rome had to be close since the council was one with the Pope and the College of Cardinals. But the plan to demand everything from Rome proved impossible. A courier needed three or four days for the trip, so an answer could not be received from Rome before a week. The same today is Italian postbus takes more time. In the leadership of the council, this manifested itself as too long a time of, and waiting for Rome's decision each time would have made the legates deprived of authority before the assembly. For example, in June 1546, there was a question about the procedure to be used for the discussion on justification. The idea of entrusting a deputation of council fathers with the discussion of the problem of justification and the preparation of the decrees was approved by only a dozen bishops. The ma majority of the bishops did not want to give up the congregation of the theologians. The legates accepted the majority decision. At the same time, however, they maintained the direction of the work. In fact, it was the president who proposed to the theologians the six questions on which the discussion were to focus. Thus, they made use of their right of proposal. On the one hand, they pleased the assembly. On the other hand, they kept the direction in their hands. I want to recall that there were five, not six as in print, questions that the moderators of the Second Vatican Council posed to the Council Fathers. 400 years after the Council of Trent, the Pope's legates, who now are called moderators, decided again to keep the direction of the work in their hands. And at the Second Vatican Council, there were strong protests. A second example of the work of legates at Trent. A month after the council opened, they discussed the way forward, so they considered whether to start with doctrine or church reform. During the discussion, the majority clearly leaned toward giving priority to the church reform. At the January 22 session, two of the legates expressed themselves in favor of giving precedence to doctrine. Finally, a decision was reached to treat the two issues in parallel. However, this de decision was totally rejected by the Pope in a letter that arrived only after the decision had been made and it was a problem of no easy solution for the legates. They then succeeded with great skill in convincing the Pope of the goodness of the plan decided by the Council and of the impossibility to, of revising a decision that had already been made for a month. The Pope also invited the abbots to the Council. 
only nullio sabots were admitted and given the right of deliberative vote. Unlike the previous council, the University at Trent were not present. Instead, individual canonists and theologians performed their service for the council. In the early years, they belonged, with one exception, to the five mendicant orders, and there were about 30 uh, theologians. The importance of theologians became greater and greater during the Council, and I will discuss this at the end of my talk. I leave out here the invitation to schismatics and Protestants. What I have described so far is largely similar to what was done at the First Vatican Council. We should therefore continue to analyze the regulation in order to understand why Pius IX should have forbidden making known the regulation of trend. Ceremonial pro procedures are part of the regulation of council because councils since ancient time have not been parliaments, but sacred meetings celebrated in church buildings. The idea that a uh, council is an assembly of representatives who decides the doctrine of the church by voting and thus by majority vote is an idea that arose only in the last century. Ancient and medieval councils did not know the idea of the quasi-parliamentary discussion with an absolute or relative majority that could decide on the Catholic faith. It was certainly not so much the discussion, but the listening that created the decision. In the early church, most of the time was spent in reading the decisions of previous councils and the writing of the church fathers. And it was only after listening to what the Holy Spirit and the council fathers had decided at previous councils that a decision which was necessarily in line with tradition, was made on the new issues that arose. In the assembly, ceremony was fundamental. Ceremony is so Piccolomini wrote, the honor given to God or to man for God. What was to be done at the council was honor God. That is not a loud discussion, but rather a theater in the highest sense of the word, in which each person in his given role plays the part to which the great director God had called him. Intrigues, slanders, attempts to manipulate the vote of the assembly are more typical or more known of Vatican councils. At Trent, they were still trying to convince a council father not to have his vote. Next to the ceremonial aspects, a trend for the first time law also had a place and that was the choice of a secretary. Let me explain. At the Lateran Council 5, the few years before, a few years before Trent, there was still no secretary of the council. It was a master of ceremonies, Paride de Grassi, who, together with the notaries, took care of those tasks that in Trent would be the secretary's job. For example, at the Fifth Lateran Council, it was Paride de Grassi who had the votes of the council father collected. In Trent, the role of the master of ceremonies was divided into two. On the one side, there was the master of ceremonies and on the other side, there was a secretary. It is also interesting to note that the rules of trend in most manuscripts are no longer simply called Ordo Concili, but now are now called Ordo et Modus in Celebrazione Sacri et Generalis Concili. There is a new element in the understanding of what a council is. 
but the ceremonial order continues to be a fundamental element. When talking about trend, we should also talk about the celebration of the solemn op opening session held in the Cathedral of Trent, or the ceremony in the hall or in the Giroldi Palace, where a preparatory meeting took place when the opening brief was read. We should talk about the three days of fasting that precede every council since ancient times and which were reduced to one, proclaimed by a torch light in the for the next day, since the council had to begin immediately. However, it would like I would like to skip skip the strictly liturgical aspects by once again recalling the great scholar of the Council of Trent, Hubert Jedin, whom I have already quoted. He writes that it's important to remember that a council session is not only a juridical ecclesiastical act, but also a liturgical ceremony like the Pope's coronation or canonization. Its liturgy is not only a formal aspect, but belongs to its substance. For if the council fulfills its task of defining the faith and discipline of the church, it performs acts of worship to God. The ceremonial in use in the Roman church contained a complete liturgy of the council, which was observed in the fifth Lateran council and as far as we know, also in the reforming council in the 15th century. We will not analyze the ceremonies at the beginning and the end of the council, but we have to consider precedents, which is always part of the ceremonial and was of fundamental importance at the Council of Trent. It is probably the topic on which Massarelli dwells upon the most in his regulation. The lengthy discussion, especially over the place to be reserved for the legates of princes, also shows the importance they had. In order not to upset different feelings, the council came up with rather creative solutions in the course of its celebration. The problem of precedence was among the first addressed by the council. A few days after the council began, it elected its first deputation. The three bishops who had the most seniority in office were given the task to control the seniority of the bishops for promo promotion, to submit to the assembly proposals concerning the place to be given to the diplomatic representatives and the treatment to be used with the laity and clergymen admitted without the right to vote. In the general congregation of January 4th, 1546, the prelates occupied for the first time the seats assigned to them by the deputation. But problems concerning precedents remain until the third and most frequently attended period. The discussion among various groups of abbots had to be resolved by the Pope he decided that they should sit according to seniority. The problem was so keenly felt that there was a risk, otherwise Massarelli would not have included all this in his rules, that for one seat and the right to speak before the others, abbots representing their congregations would be replaced to send someone more senior. The only one who did not participate in this race for precedence was the Jesuit general Diego Lainez. The latter, in fact, said last of his own accord, so after the generals of mendicants' orders, however, as the youngest religious order, where he should have said anyway. Massarelli described the seating arrangement at the council at two different times. The first time, he exposes how the seats were assigned in solemn sessions. In the image um, used to announce this conference, the seating arrangement can be clearly seen. The president's legates of the council sat in front of the altar facing the assembly. 
the other cardinals set to the right on raised and special adorned seats distinct from the others. Near these seats, but detached from them, sat the representative of Catholic King of Spain. You see it in the middle. Still on the right, above the presidents, sat the clerical representatives of the emperor, kings and princes. On the left face facing, the president said the other representatives of the emperors, kings and princes who are, were not clerics. In the middle of the hall, you can see the secretary of the council, Angelo Massarelli, at his table. And of course, you see also the assembly. After the cardinals, that's the patriarchs, and following these, there were the archbishops, bishops, and abbots, following only the date of promotion. One can also see, well, the religious, because they sat in the top of the row. In the chapter of the rules devoted to the general congregation, Massarelli then repeats a second time, in this case inserting the names of each one, the order of sitting. He dwells a great deal on this aspect, thus highlighting once again the importance that was being given to this subject. I supposed Pius IX was certainly not concerned that this news might reach the conciliar minority during the Vatican Council. Moreover, the master of ceremonies of the First Vatican Council had studied the matter, and during the First Vatican Council there were few protests from uh, Council Fathers about the position assigned. Another point, the use proponendi. A much discussed issue in the last councils, including the Council of Trent, was the use proponendi. It belonged only to the legates at each stage of the council. As did the decision as to what should be dealt with at individual sessions. In May 1546, Cardinal Madruzzo complained about the Council's failure to respond to the King of Portugal. The President of the Council, Cardinal del Monte, reacted very violently, claiming that no one had the right to propose discussion on an issue except the legates. At this point, the Spanish bishop asks a question that also interests us. What should I do if I want to bring an important issue before the Council? Del Monte replied that he should propose the issue to the legates. If they rejected it, the proposer could turn to the plenary. The question was never fully resolved. On May 18, 1546, the question of only the use proponendi granted to the legates was raised again because it was argued in the early church every bishop had had the same right to propose issues to the council. We know, however, that this does not correspond to historical reality. Even in the third council period, the use proponendi was a subject of bitter debate. Indeed, it was not accepted by some bishops that the program was proponentibus legatis. A political protest also developed in this regard, and Philip II, with the ambassador Luna, succeeded in getting the Pope, 1563, to give in to their requests. The Pope wrote he did not want to take away the freedom of the council at all, but only to take away the confusion. So Pope Pius IV gave the legates a chance to change, but the legates did not communicate the Pope's de decisions, and instead succeeded in having the use proponendi of the legates alone accepted. In the Council's regulation, Massarelli summarized the use proponendi thus. Primus presidens proponit patribus ea, que pro tempore occurrunt, de quibus sententias rogat. 
nemini enim licet nisi solis presidentibus proponere. Absente vero primo proponet secundus, et sic absente secundo tertius, etc. Non numquam autem consuevere presidenti, presidentes ea, que proposituri erant, de ferre in scriptis, que ipsis juventibus a secretario legebantur. At the First Vatican Council, the problems are avoided by establishing from the beginning a commission that would decide on the proposal, proposals that came to the Council. Thus, I cannot be said at all that with respect to this point, the Council of Trent had been freer than the First Vatican Council. On the contrary, let us look to the procedure in the procedure in the solemn and general congregation at, at the freedom of the council. In his restriction of the rules of procedure, Massarelli begins with the solemn session, so that determine a council in that its essential, essential acts take place in them. The opening and closing of the council, the del deliberative vote and the promulgation of the conciliar decrees. Once the date of the session had been set, the president's legate of the council, representatives of the ruler, the council fathers, theologians, and the nobility present in Trent, if they had received an invitation to attend from the bishop of the diocese, Cardinal Mandruzzo, gathered in the Trent Cathedral after the mass, celebrated by one of the council fathers, followed the reading of the decree or decrees that were to be voted on. Regarding the closing of the council, it also took place within a solemn session on December 3rd and 4th, 1563. It began the last session by reading aloud the doctrinal decrees of the previous period and only the third, first words of the reform decrees. The Bishop of Catania reads the Decretum Superfine Concilii et Confirmatione a Sumo Pontifice Petenda. The Fathers questions individually answered Placet, with the exception of the Bishop of Granada. Pietro Guerrero, who agreed with the closing of the council, but said, non peto confirmationem. Three bishops, on the contrary, said, peto confirmationem tamquam necessariam. Therefore, Cardinal Morone, first president, having ascertained unanimity in assenting to the closing to the, of the council, declared the council closed with the words, Nos apostolice sedis legati et presidentes edem sacro concilium finem imponimus. The wish for peace was, did not close the council as acclamations had been prepared which the Cardinal of Lorraine read aloud and to which the council fathers responded. The general congregations were necessary working meetings to prepare the decrees that were to be voted on the solemn council sessions, but also to decide the procedure and to recite, recite the representatives of the princes. The sessions of the general congregations were not open to the public, and only when the representatives of the princes were received where other people also allowed entering the congregation, but then they have to leave the assembly and did not participate in any way in the de debate. This extra omnes that will be known in the Vatican councils was thus already in use, probably in another way or with other words, but to the same effect in the session of the Council Fathers of Trent. There was such a secret to be kept, even if it was not explicitly, explicitly named, and this secrecy led to greater freedom of expression. 
but Stephen is right there. When he writes that the Admonitio of February 17, 1562, often cited as an example for secrecy, concerns only the ban on communicating decrees that were not yet ready. When the legates in the general congregation presented the topic, they proceeded to hear the opinion of the council fathers. The secretary, who for this, as we have seen, was seated in a suitable position to hear them all, noted their speeches. The speakers did not go to a specific place to speak. So the image is not correct. Um, but did so from their seat. This meant that even if someone wanted to respond, they would have to wait for their turn. In the third period, the number of souls present had greatly increased, and since every person entitled to vote had to speak on every draft decree, the procedure was very time consuming. Only souls who could not be present when it was their turn or if they had no voice, were entitled to give their vote in writing. Massarelli recalls that each person was allowed to counter what had already been said in complete freedom. It happened, so Massarelli writes, that someone did not speak in a Catholic matter, and so several participants would get up shooting Heck non sunt dicenda, heck heresim sapiunt. Or accusing the council father openly of heresy. The president of the council did not accept, so the secretary recalls, this behavior and criticized it so that the full freedom of expression of the fathers would remain clear. The freedom of the council was one of the most felt problems in Trent. Perhaps it was precisely Luther's demand for a free council that had made the participants in Tridentine assembly sensitive. But probably the greatest pressure that the council experienced regarding its freedom came from the princes and the emperor. Their interference there was in the disciplinary sphere and only in that. After the discussion, the legates presidents evaluated all that had been said and presented sometimes with the help of a commission, a decree which in turn was discussed uh, in general congregation. Suggestions would be noted down and then the decrees would be revised. Voting would be performed by first identifying the issues that needed an immediate response. In that case, the votes were, were counted immediately and the decision was made by a majority vote. This was the case, for example, when a committee was to be formed or the date of the next congregation or the admission for princess representative had to be decided. Regarding the date, as in previous councils, at the end of each session, it was always decided when the next session would be convened. Frequently, general congregations ended only late at night since they also began very late in the evening. The right to vote and the different votes. Being invited to the council did not automatically mean having a del deliberative vote. Those who were invited had only an advisory vote could affect with their opinion only during the preparatory phase of a document. When it came to making the final decision in the last voting stage, usually within the framework of a solemn session of a council, they in fact no longer had to write to vote. We must therefore distinguish, even in Trent, between those who participated 
in the preparation and discussion of a document and those who decided the fate of that text in the official venue of, the, of each council in the public session by casting their deliberative <coughs> vote. First, the deliberative votes. Massarelli describes how the ballot on Tridentine decrees took place. The text that would be voted was read aloud. At the end of the reading of each decree, the fathers would be asked, Reverendissimi et illustrissimi domini, Reverendi queer patres, lagetne hec vobis, hec omnia vobis, at this point, the secretary would ask each father individually, unplaxiat. The notaries of the council would note down the responses of the individuals, and if the fathers delivered their response in writing, they would take over the papers. The secretary would ask the legates and presidents for their votes first, then the cardinals, patriarchs, archbishops, bishops, then the abbot, and last, the general of the religious order, last of all, Diego Lainez, the Jesuit. Having collected all the votes, these were taken to the presidents and counted by them. If everyone approved the decree, the first president of the council would say in a loud voice, Sanctissimi Padres decretum approbatum est, ab omnibus nemine discrepante, gratia gendes und deo. At the fathers responded, Deo gratias. Hinchus rightly recalls, and it's a quotation, this vote alone was the decisive one. Also, certainly the result after the preparatory consultants in the general congregation could not be doubted. The vote, together with the proclamation of the legates, that the decree found the acceptance of the synod made the decision definitely assent. End of the quotation. Massarelli writes that if not everyone approved, this was of course said and it was also explained what exactly they were asking for. Massarelli then describes the procedure followed when the number of votes was questioned. In this case, the votes were re-read in the order in which they had been collected, and each conciliar father could acknowledge and reconfirm his vote. Those who could not attend the session due to illness could also vote. They would deliver their vote in writing, and it would be counted along with the others. Let us see the other voting. There never seemed to have been any consideration of voting by, for example, nations as a council of constants, thus different from individual voting. Rather, it mainly appeared that to what had been done at the Fifth Lateran Council, when the right to vote had been granted only to cardinal bishops, abbots, and general of order. In any case, the suite of voting by nations still hovered over trend. Roger writes in his study of on nations at the Council of Trent that the Bishop of Cava, San Felice, coming to Trent to prepare the lodgings, proposed to use the natural division of the city into four districts to distribute over them the dwellings of four nations expected at the Council, Italy, Germany, France, and Spain. On the other hand, voting by nations had waned. Indeed, the canonists Ugoni and Jacobazzi do not mention it at all in their treatise that were important for the Tridentine regulation. Concretely, voting was used during the preparation of decrees to ascertain how many approved the decrees and, after the required modifications, was repeated until a conspicuous majority was found. We have already seen that solemn votes were done by questioning each eligible person individually. 
and then would give them their answer aloud. The same thing happened in adversary votes. The eligible voters could respond with placet or non placet, but often the placet was tied to some condition. Unanimity in reform decrees was not always achieved. Also, it was sought every time. The freedom of the council fathers in expressing themselves and the unanimity of votes, at least on doctrinal aspects, were really also much discussed at the first Vatican Council. Was this was Pius IX wanted to hide from the anti-infallibilists? Objectively, the Council Fathers, both at Trent and at the First Vatican Council, were free to express their opinions. Of course, to defend one's opinion contrary to the mainstream in both in the 16th and in the 19th century took courage. But no conciliar rule prevents this. Secrecy was often brought, brought up. However, it is precisely the secrecy of the discussion that helped the council father to say what they thought without having to worry about what someone might have thought outside the hall. Regarding the unanimity of votes, the difficulty is not secondary. And during the first Vatican Council, it was one of the strongest points that the anti-infallibilists always opposed to the will of the conciliar majority. In their claims, however, the minority never had to call into question the rules of the Council of Trent. The histories of the Council of Trent, especially the one written by the Jesuit Pallavicino on the original documents, which he was able to get from Castel Sant'Angelo for this purpose, already told that, that told all that was necessary. Also, the historian Ignaz von Döllinger wrote this, Augustine Tyner was probably not dismissed by Pius IX because he handed over the rules of Trent to the conciliar minority. Pius IX was already unhappy with his archivist, who apparently also had a drinking problem. But for the conciliar minority to which historian Döllinger of Munich also belonged, Tyner's silence about his dismissal was useful in mounting a fake news that has persisted for 150 years. Before closing my long talk, I would like to return once again to the Council of Trent because there is one aspect that is new, in my opinion brilliant and unfortunately not replicated at the Vatican Councils. It is about the congregation of minor theologians to which I have already referred. Since the spring of 1546, the theologians were discussing in their own meetings the issues that the council was dealing with. The discussion before the cardinal legates and the council fathers who came to hear him. Then, the theologians could only use topics from the holy scriptures, the councils and the, con the church fathers. The council fathers could not speak, but by listening to the discussion, they could learn new elements and form their own judgment. At Vatican Councils 1 and 2, this system was no longer applied. Theologians prepared before the councils the documents that were then largely rejected during the council. Perhaps it would have been better to apply the trend method. At the last two councils, only, only the wealthy council fathers could afford their own theologians. Therefore, it is no wonder that in this council, practically only the council fathers spoke to whom someone could prepare an address and explain the subject matter well, which was often not easily. 
The rules of the Council of Trent and Massarelli taught it were certainly not perfect. But they guaranteed the whole assembly equal rights. The bishop at the council votes seated because he is a judge, a judge in matter of faith and moral. But this judge had to be given a way to prepare and form his judgment as objectively as possible. Therefore, I want to conclude by saying that the regulation of the Council of Trent were truly a milestone and an example to be imitated in church law because they avoided some of the discriminations which became later typical of councils that are more recent. Thank you. Thank you.